Hello, everybody. It's John Legend here with Take Black the Vote. I have a very special guest I'm going to be speaking to. She ran for governor in the state of Georgia and since that election has spent all of her time and energy focused on making sure our elections are fair, making sure our census is fair, and uh, generally making sure our democracy is strong. Please welcome Stacey Abrams. Hello, it's such an honor to be here with you. My pleasure. Now, I had the pleasure of campaigning with you, fundraising for you when you ran for governor, and um, the outcome of that election and the, and the conduct of that election uh, was very questionable. And at the end of that process, a lot of us were frustrated because the secretary of state, the person who ran the election in Georgia, was also running against you in Georgia and was able to rig the rules, rig the registrations uh, to make it more likely that he could win. So what have you been doing since that uh, fiasco uh, in Georgia to uh, try to make things better in Georgia and across the country? Well, once again, John, I want to say thank you for all of the support you gave me, both both financially, but also just speaking up about the issues that matter and why the elections mattered. So I'm not the governor, which means I've had some free time on my hands. I started three organizations, Fair Fight, which is focused on making sure we have voter protection across the country. We started in Georgia, but we're working in 18 states around the country, ensuring that we have free and fair elections this year. Fair Count, which is focused on making sure that we have an accurate census, particularly for African Americans, we are the most likely to be undercounted in the census. And this determines not only the allocation of trillions of dollars, but it's also how we allocate political power for the next decade. And if anybody is confused about what that means, imagine what it was like 2009 when Barack Obama got in the office and what happened in 2011 when John Boehner took over the Speaker of the House. That's what happens with the census year but it's also the money not going to our communities. And then the third group I created is called the Southern Economic Advancement Project, which really focuses on making sure that communities in the South have the economic power they need to be competitive in the country. And we are particularly working on how we make the South strong when it comes to COVID-19 and the recovery. Let's talk about how much elections matter. Now that uh, uh, Kemp is the governor of Georgia and you've seen the way he has managed the state during this uh, global pandemic. Um, how frustrating is it to watch him uh, uh, manage a public health crisis? It's been atrocious. And part of it is every piece of work that I started in 2018 when I didn't become governor has become incredibly important in 2020 because he is the governor the work we're doing on Fair Fight. If people watched June 9th and watched the meltdown of our elections, that's you know attributable to the current Secretary of State, but he built on the malfeasance and the incompetence of Brian Kemp when he was Secretary of State, plus the refusal of the state to pass laws that fix the problems. Uh, when it comes to the census, the organization I created, Fair Count, is spending more money on encouraging people to participate in the census than the state of Georgia is. Mm -hmm. We've done more work to engage communities. And then with South Strong, we are helping to assist those communities that weren't counted in the census and that were disenfranchised in the election, which means that especially black communities, you know, Georgia has one of the highest black populations of any battleground state. And the South has 58% of all the black people in America. And that means that when you have incompetent governors like a Brian Kemp refusing to do masks, closing late, opening early, you not only cripple us in terms of our public health, our economy is collapsed, and we have too many essential workers who are often black and brown who are being forced to go to work without masks, without protection, and without the resources they need. And God help them if they need unemployment, because Georgia is one of those states that's been lagging behind on actually delivering services and resources to our people. So. Elections matter. So speaking about the election, I, I think a lot of people can get frustrated, uh, cynical. Um, they can feel hopeless when they see that there are forces in power that are actively trying to discourage people from voting, trying to suppress the vote, trying to um, put disinformation out there uh, to um, to make people feel like uh, there's no point in them voting. Um, talk about what you all are doing 
regarding that to counter those forces? I want people to understand that voting is power. It is our power. And they're trying to steal our power from us. Mm. I want people to be angry. I want them to be righteous and say, you can't have it. And so the work we do through Fair Fight is that we're working in states, helping build infrastructure, making sure people know, number one, how they're going to steal. It's making sure you can register and that you stay on the roll. So check your registration. Even if you vote every time, do not take it for granted. It's making sure people know how they can cast their ballots. 42 states plus the District of Columbia allow you to vote by mail. So do it if you can. But we have a lot of states that let you vote early and let you vote on Election Day. And we need to make certain that on Election Day, your precinct is still open, that they haven't artificially closed it, which is part of what creates those long lines. And so what we're doing through Fair Fight is working in every single one of those 18 states, making sure that folks know what their rights are, know how to defend themselves, but more importantly, that you don't have to work that hard. You shouldn't have to work this hard in a democracy to use your basic right. And so if folks want more information, you go to fairfight2020.org. We can tell you about how either you can protect your own rights or how you can help protect the rights of others. So um, we've seen uh, some conversation recently around what's going to happen with the Postal Service. Uh, Donald Trump put one of his cronies in charge of the Postal Service, and there seems to have been some deliberate slowdowns when it comes to um, the the mail writ large, but also uh, I think targeted particularly uh, around voting by mail. So talk a little bit about what's happening with that and if there's any defense against uh, what they're doing um, with the post office. So because we know that Americans are going to need to vote by mail, we're in the first wave of the pandemic, the second peak, and the second wave isn't gonna hit till the fall. We know vote by mail is the safest way to vote. We've watched Donald Trump run around and tweet about lies. Voting by mail is safe. It's not, it's not more susceptible to fraud. We don't have voter fraud in the United States by any real measure. And so the reality is he's doing his best to put out misinformation and to scare people. It's not working. We have more Americans voting by mail than any time in our history. But the second approach is to stop the mail itself. And so he put his fundraising friend in charge of the post Postal Service. He has cut the budget. He has slowed down the delivery of mail. But Congress can take action. The HEROES Act is incredibly important because the HEROES Act, number one, says vote by mail has to be available in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. That right now we're at 42 states. We need it to be all 50 states without excuses. Everyone can use it and with the same rules. So you don't have to become a lawyer to understand how to vote by mail. But the second piece is that that same bill includes billions of dollars for the Postal Service to make certain it works. Because we have to remember, the Postal Service isn't just about delivering mail. If you live in a rural community, it's how you get your medicine. It's how you get your food. And so he's not just playing with elections. He's undermining economies and lives. And so hopefully Republicans will get past their need to hold on to power by cheating and will remember that they serve the American people and will work together with Democrats to put those dollars in place. But we need every person to call your U.S. senator and demand they pass the HEROES Act, which will protect vote by mail, protect in-person voting, but also protect the Postal Service. It's interesting because I I, uh, I think Trump is under the impression that um, Republicans will vote less by mail than Democrats. And so he, if he sabotages vote by mail, then it'll help him win. But um, there's not a lot of evidence, clear evidence right now, that that's even a good electoral strategy for him because uh, it's unclear what's going to happen in a pandemic and who's going to vote more by mail than others. And uh, he may be sabotaging his own vote uh, by doing this, but I think he believes that uh, the the idea of more turnout is always bad for Republicans. And traditionally, that's probably been the case. Uh, but it's unclear that that's the case during a pandemic. We, don't, we just don't know what's going to happen. And Democrats aren't saying more Democrats should vote. We're saying everybody should be able to vote. Exactly. So there, there are two parts to that. One of, one of the problems is he got rid of Brad Parscale as his uh, campaign manager. Bill mm -hmm. Stepien, the guy he put in, promoted the man who is in charge of voter suppression for Trump. His name is mm -hmm. Justin Clark. 
This guy is only thinking about how he helps Trump. He's not thinking about anybody else. And what you're seeing is actually rebellion from Republicans. The Republican Secretary of State in Mitch McConnell's home state of Kentucky, he made sure that everyone could vote by mail. And he said, we're wrong. Republicans are wrong to stop this. Utah votes entirely by mail. And so Republicans are saying, by the way, especially in the South, the most likely voters by mail are white seniors. And there's this big state that's just south of Georgia that relies on vote by mail a lot. Yes. If you cut off vote by mail, a lot of white seniors. <laughs> and so we have to remember that this, to your point, if you break the machinery of democracy, regardless of your race, regardless of your political leanings, you break it for everyone. And he's not thinking, I think, about the long-term consequences. He's He read the top line of some memo and that's all he cares about. And that's why you're hearing Republicans pushing back on him and sending out messaging to their people saying, please vote by mail. Yes. And uh, there's this odd distinction they try to draw between absentee uh, voting and voting by mail. Is there any tangible difference between absentee voting and voting by mail? Just the number of letters in the words. They are the exact same thing. <laughs> vote from home, vote by mail, absentee balloting, mail-in voting, all the same thing. So everybody, if you live in a state where they call it absentee voting and you have to request a ballot, request a ballot and uh, uh, an absentee vote. Uh, if they call it voting by mail uh, and they ask you to request a, request a ballot, request a ballot to vote by mail. And uh, if there's issues with the Postal Service and there are ways to drop it off in certain places, um, then uh, maybe you'll want to do that as well just to ensure that uh, it won't get stuck in the mail. But do it early. As soon as it's uh, available to you, do it early because uh, that way you'll ensure that the slowdown in the Postal Service won't uh, result in your vote not being counted. And the, the other part of that is if you vote by mail, if you can, you're also making it safer for those who don't have the choice. Yes. You've got 43 million people who are now subject to eviction because of the inaction of Mitch McConnell. Those 43 million people may not be living where they can receive vote by mail applications, but they can still go and vote in person, but it's safer for them if you vote it by mail and you're not in that line. It's yeah. also true that if you try to vote by mail, if you vote as early as, as you said, John, if you vote early, as soon as you can, if something goes wrong, you have time to go get in line to cure it and make sure it works on election day. And so we have to remember we want vote by mail, but we also want in-person voting early and we want in-person voting on the day of and we need as many precincts to be open as possible we can't have what we saw happen in kentucky and in wisconsin and in georgia and nevada where they shut down the in-person opportunities because not everyone can or should vote by mail if you're disabled if you have a language barrier if you're homeless or evicted or if you legitimately don't trust the process because they've done things to make it harder for you you need to be able to go and vote in person So let's talk a little bit about uh, one of the people who's inspired all of us to fight for voting rights, uh, a person who uh, we just lost recently, who had laid down his life, uh, uh, put his life at risk many times to make sure we had the right to vote, Uh, a Georgian, um, John Lewis, Representative John Lewis. We've all had a chance to speak about him and his legacy lately and honor him, but talk a little bit about Um, what he fought for when it came to voting rights and what the Democrats have recently passed in the House uh, as the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. So I had the honor in March of speaking at the 55th anniversary of the march across the the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I spoke at Brown Memorial AME Church and I got to call Congressman Lewis the night before just to check on him uh, because he was undergoing treatment he, he had actually um, finished the treatment. He wanted to be there. He wasn't sure he'd make it. But, you know, he talked about, you know, marching across that bridge. He talked about, you know, being knocked out, knocked unconscious. And what was so extraordinary to me was that despite the fact that he was battling stage four pancreatic cancer, when we marched across the bridge, I get this call to come to this black car that's sitting on the side of the bridge. And it's Congressman Lewis. He refused to let that march happen without being there. And so I got to help hold him up as he climbed the stepladder so he could be seen and be heard because he understood 
that in this moment, in 2020, the fight for the right to vote is real and that voter suppression may have changed outfits and changed garb, but the, the intention hasn't changed. And that's why the restoration of the Voting Rights Act, the work that is being done through H.R. 4, the bill that was introduced by Terry Sewell that honors his name now, that's why it must pass the Senate because voting rights are the power of our democracy. And this man did everything for most of his life to make us meet our ideals. And there is no better tribute to who we say we are than to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Now, let's um, let's kind of end this on a note of hope. I've heard you talk a little bit about um, what you're seeing, the kinds of changes you're seeing as a result of the work you're doing in Georgia, what you're seeing when it comes to registration, uh, what you're seeing in terms of um, how significant and powerful the black vote is and the other uh, votes of people of color in the South right now. Talk a little bit about that and, and how this 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 year could mark the beginning of Georgia being a swing state. So in 2018, I lost by 54,723 votes if anybody's counting. And mm -hmm. that represents 1.4% of margin of difference. Since that day, 750,000 new people have registered to vote who were either ineligible or were unable to vote in 2018. 49% of those people are people of color. And in the South, race is the strongest predictor of political leanings. 45% are under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. Youth is one of the strongest predictors of political leanings. Georgia has the highest percentage of black voters of any swing state, 33%. The second closest is North Carolina at 22%. And we have two Senate races, 16 electoral college votes, the same number as Michigan. And we have House races that we can flip. Plus, we can flip the state legislature and the House of Representatives and be a part of redistricting, which means that the 14 congressional leaders can better reflect the makeup of our state. That's how you change the South. And when you change the South, John, you've heard me say this, when you change the South, you change America. The South is where people are moving. It is where life is growing. The Sun Belt, when you add in the Southwest, we are the epicenter of change. And if you want to invest early in Apple and Google and the way we win in the future, come South, come now, come to Georgia. Wow. So, folks, um, that message uh, is important for everybody around the country, um, how uh, things are changing. And we we get kind of stuck in this red versus blue conversation and we think certain states are set in their ways and impossible to change. But we see that elections really do matter. Organizing matters. Um, registering people to vote matters, activating them, making them understand that their vote really will count and that it can move uh, the state and move the country. I think all of those things are so important. And I'm so glad that Stacey Abrams is doing that on our behalf in Georgia, across the South and across this country. Thank you, Stacey Abrams. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and to hear your words of encouragement, your words of courage, your words of activism and uh, your words of your fighting words. <laughs> John Legend, you are a extraordinary leader. Your activism and your artistry just make things so much easier to do. So thank you for always being in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. Thank you, Stacy. Great to talk to you. Take care. Bye-bye.